there's so many little things that have been happening behind SoFi's doors that play a large impact on the actual price of the stock. Now, unless you're a deep diver, a real big researcher into the company, you're not going to hear about any of these things on public forums. So in this video, I want to shout out everything that you guys might be interested in hearing because it's what I'm interested in hearing before Q4 earnings to make the best informed decisions with your SoFi stock. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was Michael Rowland and him discovering a little secret on Google Trends. That's SoFi Bank. He just typed it in on the uh, United States in the past year. Okay. What you can see is that the analytics right now are expecting a new all-time high, pushing out some of these statistics that we used to see, you know, in, in January of 2022. This is most likely because of the moratorium actually getting pushed. But now because of our high savings accounts, or at, the, at least this is what Michael Rowland is suspecting, is that we might actually be hitting all-time highs once again, which could also lead to higher member growth in the long term. Now, obviously, we won't know anything in terms of the numbers until the earnings actually come out. It's just sort of Google Trends, which happen to be going in the right direction. I've also showed off in another video that website traffic for SoFi specifically also looks very similar in terms of their trends. We're going up month over month over month, and that includes Q4 numbers. Now, the difference is, is that whenever I put those numbers up against other companies like Upstart, Ally Bank, or even Robinhood, those numbers are down month over month, right? And we're not seeing that across the fintech industry, it's specifically in SoFi's case. Another interesting idea is just simply the fact that SoFi's earnings actually got, you know, pushed early to January 30th, expecting that usually our earnings actually come out for Q4 around February time, usually February 10th, something along those times. But there is a little bit of technical analysis that would show you that there is actually a little bit of hidden knowledge here that if a company schedules its earnings much earlier than normal, it's usually because of good news. And the same applies for the opposite direction, right? If companies delay their earnings, it's actually usually bad news. So, and, and this is also what Forbes has covered and, and, you know, they've done their research on these numbers, but it is exciting to know whether you're a technical analysis type of person that getting it pushed forward is definitely a great sign as well. Now, is it going to be a great quarter? I don't know yet. I'm just looking at what I have available to me. But what we do know is that student loans, which was supposed to be a big category in Q4, although earlier they told us that it wasn't going to be priced into 2022 numbers, it actually was on the back half of Q4. Meaning that there was revenue and adjusted EBITDA that was guided for in Q4 that we're not actually going to see. Now, of course, that's not a good thing, but I do want to add a couple snippets in here that actually make it a little bit different, okay? One is the fact that this memoratorium push is not like any other moratorium push that we've seen previously, the seven other pushes that we've seen or extensions to the pause, right? This time, lenders actually know how much they're going to get back. Lenders know that if they make over $125,000 or $250,000 per family, that they won't be able to get any of their actual forgiveness back, and so they might actually want to start paying now if they have the money to do so. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to see a huge flock of clients that make over $125,000, which I might note is our actual prime client client, right? We do make our average client makes over $160,000 on our personal loan over 170,000 on our student loan. But right now the payments are still interest free, right? So they might still not want to actually come back early because they can just wait. But there are some people that don't like to wait and they do just want to start paying that back. And we might see more numbers than we expected. But we are seeing a lot of great signs that maybe these numbers are better than we expected. Because in December, which is the back half of, you know, 2022, which is where we're supposed to be seeing those student loan drop-offs, where we're supposed to be missing this quarter, and that's what's priced into the stock, really, is that Anthony Noto has purchased $7.4 million worth of the stock. Now, why do that right before a missed earnings? And these are the sort of the things that sort of boggle my mind is like, why would he purchase right before a miss? He could completely, if he believes in the long-term version of this company, he could just buy all these shares right after earnings, get a way better price on all these shares, which obviously now looking at it, the prices that he purchased at versus today at, you know, five plus dollars, he's already up on his $7.4 million worth of shares. I was able to acquire quite a large bulk of shares during the time when it was under $4 a share because of that, you know, big benefit of Anthony Noto purchasing. I'm a big believer that in insider buying, especially from the CEO, the person that knows most about the company is a great sign. And obviously he's not just throwing away his money. So it was a big purchase reason for me, aside from all the other, you know, due diligence that we're putting into this company. I've covered that extensively in other videos though. So I'll leave that there. What I did want to talk about also in this video is how other companies are actually perceiving SoFi. Now I want to take it a year back. Let's see back in January of uh, 2022, where NerdWallet revealed their best of award 
award winners for different checking accounts, credit cards, all these different things. So I wanted to scroll through and why don't we just do this? Let me go ahead and search for SoFi's name, which comes up two times in the best personal loan winners for 2022. Best personal loans for good and excellent credit scores. SoFi had won that. And then the best online personal loan. Absolutely amazing. Those are probably the two best categories that we could have won, you know, overall. And then funny enough, best personal loan from a bank closed down. Mark Marcus has closed down. So that's, uh, isn't that quite exciting? So maybe we can take that spot from Marcus as well. Maybe we'll be in three categories for uh, personal loans. But let's look at the next year's because this data just came out. This is NerdWallet's 2023 Best of Award winners, okay? Let's do the exact same thing. I'm going to search up SoFi, and now there's seven names where SoFi has popped up in their Best of Awards, okay? Now we have Best Overall Checking Account, Best for Highest Interest, Best for No Monthly Fees, best for no monthly uh, overdraft fee avoidance, and then also best checking and savings account combo. And then going on to the personal loans, we actually still only hit two. However, the category that Marcus used to claim is just completely gone. They don't even give an award out for that because who are they gonna give it to, right? So still continuing to be the best online personal loan and the best personal loan for good to excellent credit. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. This is just one company, one blog that's giving us high praise, okay? Which, out of the grand scheme of things, is extremely small. And you can actually find some other things in, involving bank rate and Forbes advisors that also put SoFi in a very high praise as well that we just, you know, found recently at the end of the year. But the reason why I like NerdWallet is that they're a public company, so we can actually see how many people are actually seeing these blogs. As we go down through the list, okay, you can see that they get around 19 million monthly unique users every single month, okay? That's on average. And if we can continue down, this has not been a spectacular quarter for them either. You can actually see that this is actually a pretty good average for how well they've been doing. So consistently, year over year, SoFi is being spotlight or spotlit as, you know, the best online checking and savings and the best personal loans. And that's being sent out to around, you know, 19 million unique users per month. But I just find it really interesting that we're staying on the tops of these lists as we're also growing out in multiple different industries as well. And this is sort of the economies of scale sort of, you know, idea that I like to think about because the bigger we get, and if we can continue being, you know, the most innovative high-end type of product for these people, that we'll be in more blogs and higher praise and more awards every single year, which just gets in front of more eyeballs, which leads to more money, which leads to the stock that we'll end up buying, which could lead to, you know, dividends, buyback shares, or just stock increase in the prices as years go on. Just a quick side note, I'm just editing this in. As the amount of eyeballs see so far, it, it helps the company actually grow overall. And I think we don't get nearly enough love for SoFi Stadium. Anthony Noto just recently posted some pictures of a 70,000 to 100,000 person audience at a college football game. Now, this is happening consistently at SoFi Stadium because they are a world-renowned tech forward stadium. Everyone is going to go see this stadium because it's an absolute marvel, okay? It's, it's not like anything else in the entire country. And all the biggest artists and events are happening here, like Taylor Swift, Ed Sheeran, BTS, the Super Bowl, okay? And you know, you have things like YouTube theater there that continue to just bring in so many new people. And plastered all over it is SoFi's beautiful name. We paid $625 million for 20 years worth of naming rights for SoFi, for which we also got a $12 million discount during COVID. So around $613 million, which averages out to about $30 million, $31 million per year. Whenever you consider that just in one single Super Bowl, a 30 second ad costed $5.6 million this year. That's about a two and a half minute ad per year. But yet our name during the Super Bowl stayed up the entire time. And then not only that, but also to every other world renowned event that's happening like WrestleMania and all these other university football games that are happening to fill all the gaps between all the Rams games, you know, and all the other events that I spoke about. Just wanted to add that in that I've actually turned quite bullish on the actual SoFi Stadium and I don't think that we overpaid. Okay, back to the video. Now, I know what you're probably thinking, what is going to happen to SoFi stock in 2023? 
Now, this isn't an exact prediction, and I've already given mine many times, but I'd like to hear from Zachary Perret, the CEO of Plaid, and a personal friend and business partner to Anthony Noto. Now, he does say that new fintech startup creations will be substantially slower and that they will require partner banks and banking as a service providers. Now, that's exactly what Galileo and Technosys are, and if they are slower, that means potentially less new signups for small fintech companies that Galileo and Technosys get in the year to come. He said that, you know, recovery in the pace of fintech formation expected in late 2023 or early 24. Now he said this will be made up by the continued push for big tech, retail, e-commerce, and banks themselves to launch new products, okay? How are they gonna do that? Hopefully through things like Technosys and Galileo, which that's exactly what we've been saying, right? The big talks that we're in now are with, you know, consumer platforms and big financial institutions. We're done talking about small companies anymore. We want to get the big fish because those are really the ones that might only be able to play in the new year. I made it a little bit bigger and this next part hits home, okay? Like seriously, I think he's talking to Anthony Noto. Uh, profitability will be the primary focus for late stage fintech. This will lead to a focus on slower, sustainable growth and products that deliver short-term returns. Initiatives like internationalization and new vertical expansion will move slowly or be paused altogether. What he's probably talking about, if I'm going to actually relate this to SoFi, is things like SoFi Singapore and SoFi UAE that were supposed to come out in 2022, have not come out, okay? And they might not even come out this year either. Now, going back, he talks about crypto a little bit here. And I mean, SoFi is into crypto. However, we're supposed to be getting out. So let's just pass that. Uh, loan volumes will remain depressed. Lenders will focus on efficiency after years of high volume lending. Lenders will retrench and expect to see an increase to, in digitalization as lenders hunker down and focus on cost efficiency in 2023. Actually quite exciting if people think that what we need for this stock is just, you know, profitability, right? Instead of you know, like ultra high growth, now let's actually get some lending practices in. And that's actually what I think that this stock actually needs to become a proper company that big Wall Street investors actually wanna see. Servicing and loss mitigation will be a core focus for lenders. With forbearances and borrower assistance coming to an end, delinquencies will return and even surpass pre-COVID levels. We'll see a deeper focus on risk management and more use of data to monitor loans. I think he's right here. I do actually think that things are going to get harder. I mean, th that's why this stock is so depressed. It's just a matter of how hard it's going to be if there's been over fear in the market that's led this stock down into the 4 or $5 ranges, when really at the end of the day, we might be sit laying somewhere along maybe the 8 to $10 range in terms of a fair value. Nowhere near the 20 to $25 of the extreme hype that this stock was just going to absolutely take over. Is there still 100% margin there, in my opinion, for the stock to return to about $8 to $10? Absolutely. And that's probably where I would place, you know, an average target for this stock by year end. Now, this one's really interesting. Oh my gosh. Okay. B2B fintech companies will continue to ramp up efforts to sell to banks. B2B fintech companies? Okay. Over the last year, banks have been quite receptive to B2B fintechs as they look for products to accelerate their digital roadmaps. As we say at Plaid, banks are the biggest fintech companies. Like, is Anthony Noto not an oracle of what the future products are? And, and you know what? That's also to say that I'm giving all the credit to a future prediction of what Plaid CEO is also saying, but they are talking. And these are very smart CEOs that have dominated these past couple of years, okay? And now... Whenever you see Galileo focusing on their B2B product, it's because we know what's going to be coming in the future. It's the same thing that happened in 2020. Whenever student loans went away, we pivoted so quickly. So are we going to roll over and just absolutely lose a whole industry of, of slowing loans? No, we're going to pick up and actually focus on the growing industries like B2B fintech and, and, you know, actually providing to some of the larger banks and these sorts of things. Now, it's not the exciting 2023 prediction like some people were hoping for, but this does actually mean a great thing going long term. For example, if some companies can't survive the next maybe increase in defaults, this could lead to a giant in fintech for the people who actually can survive. Now, my bets would be on the likes of things like Lending Club and SoFi. But there have been a lot of them that have actually gone down under the noses of some people who haven't been paying attention. For example, Common Bond, just quietly winding down operations and closing down. This happened in September. Or even Goldman Sachs, who just quietly started shutting down Marcus because they couldn't find a road to profitability. And we spoke about that recently. Even today, right before I started recording, 
JP Morgan shuts website down. It paid $175 million for, for just making up fake accounts. Now, this was, uh, I think it was called Frank. Yeah, Frank. And they just closed it down because supposedly 70% of the emails that they actually got just bounced whenever they tried to send them out, you know, updates about uh, certain products. So JP Morgan is also shutting that down. People are finding it very hard to actually stay in this industry. So it's funny whenever companies like SoFi and Lending Club are growing so much, it seems to be like that we've actually found out the secret sauce and how to make this work. And it's a massive industry. And not only, whenever it does start to quiet down, the thing that I actually puts, you know, SoFi on the edge for me, rather than a lending club, is the idea of diversification. Our financial services industries can grow like crazy. And then on top of that, our technology platform is also a completely different business that can grow spectacularly as well. But that is pretty much it, guys. If you guys want to go check out my Twitter account, I'll leave that down in the description down below. Or if you could, just while you're down there, hit the like button and subscribe down below if you want to see more financial content just like this. Bye for now.